Okay, so Nehemiah chapter 8, you there? If you're there, let me know by saying, Jesus rebuilds and restores. Okay, remember I told you there'd be a second passage. Well, Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look at that very, very quickly, but in just a moment. So Nehemiah chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 2, I'll be reading and teaching from the New Living Translation. It's a thought for thought translation that really helps the tone and the tenor of the text come to life for you and I. But for me, I love the book of Nehemiah. I think it's awesome. I think it's so amazingly descriptive about really, truly multitudinous facets of life. Like some people look to Nehemiah to be like, man, that's the book on leadership. Maybe, you know, Nehemiah 13, he's, he's kind of ripping people's hair and beating them to death. I don't know if that's the best leader in the world, but there's certain things about him that are good. But if, you're, if you've got a leader that's doing that to you, that's not healthy. You probably should, you know, change that up a little bit. But the book of Nehemiah is part of the grander story of the work of God in regathering, rebuilding, and restoring His people who were once in captivity. This is why I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2. Because listen to how Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, it's a lot of Scripture. Back row, left side. Is it okay if we read a lot of scripture in church? Okay, Miss K says absolutely. So we're going to go with Miss K. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of God about your life and mine. Ephesians chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying, listen to how like gnarly this is, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. There's like four messages in that text, but we're not going to get into it. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, he says following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Verse 4, this is where it gets good. But God, who hates you? No, but God, the great cosmic killjoy? No, But God, the man upstairs, no, God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us, what does it say there, church? Life. He gave us life. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you're saved. Verse 6 For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. Verse 7, so God can point to to us all in future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for those who are united with Christ Jesus. Listen to verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation's not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. Listen, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things that he planned for us long ago. I would so strongly encourage you to memorize that set of scriptures. It will change your attitude on a Monday. Like, wow, God has stuff for me to do today. And my relationship with him is not based on how good I am, but based on how good he is. It is a joy to be a Christian. It is a peace through challenge for the Christian. There is hope. When there is no hope in anything or anyone else, and 
It's free. Here's the deal. Jesus brings us, all of us who so choose to follow him, out of captivity to sin and death. And just by being born of a woman, let's see what we've got in common. Anyone here born of a woman? You know that? Look at that. We're more unified than you thought. Just by being born of a woman, you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We are sinners in need of a God who's rich in mercy, in need of a God who's rich in grace. And the good news is, Jesus has done it for you. He's paid the price for you to have new life. This is what Nehemiah shows us. Listen to me. Nehemiah, it's a physical illustration of our spiritual dynamic. You see, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Old Testament speaks in story. New Testament speaks in syllogism many times or statements, or thoughts, or concepts. But when you read them together, it's always one scarlet thread woven throughout each text. And that's the beauty of the salvation that's available in Jesus because of his life, death, burial, resurrection, and don't miss this Christian, ascension. Because he has gone up, the Spirit has come down. And let me have your attention, let me have your eyes. Many of you don't live that way. Many of us miss that, that we are empowered by the Spirit of God to live the life He has for us. It's not us reading the book and going, okay, this is what we got to do. Okay, I got to get it done. Okay, I got to say no to the flesh, no to the... No, it's, you know what it is? What I feed grows. What I starve dies. And I have been given new life and I'm empowered by the Spirit of God, so I am just going to stop trying to be like Jesus and just start liking Jesus, and then I'll become like Jesus. I'll live by the grace of God, not by the grit of my religious duty, but my, my relational delight in Him. That's life as it's meant to be lived. Well, here, historically in Nehemiah, turn back there with me, if you will, to Nehemiah chapter 8. We are in the times and in the life of the people of God when they're being brought out of captivity. And there are kind of four acts of this regathering and this rebuilding and this restoring. The first act would be when Cyrus, the Persian ruler, issued a decree to allow the Jews to return. Second act was the first wave of God's people returning and they rebuild the city. You find that in the book of Ezra. The third act is found in Nehemiah chapter 1 through 7. It's where we've been since February together. It's the restoration of the city walls. Well, now this morning, we find ourselves in the fourth great restorative event for the people of God. And here's what it is. It's a return to the Word of God. This morning... What we see, now this might be Christianese or a church word, but here it is, revival. Say, man, that's like a church thing. Like, what does that mean? Did you know if you look it up at dictionary.com, here's what revival means. An improvement in the condition or strength of something. You know what? Hopefully this morning you woke up and you revived your breath, you know? Hopefully when you woke up this morning, you, 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 you kind of revived your aroma. Does that make sense? Like, you revived. Hopefully, when you woke up this morning, you revived your like, ability to sustain. You ate some oatmeal or something. Revival is part of every day of your life. But, but as it relates to a Christian, listen to what Andrew Murray once wrote. If you've never read anything by Andrew Murray, what are you doing? You need to read that guy. That guy's awesome. Listen to what he says. This is what Andrew Murray says. He says, making alive again those who have been alive but have fallen into what is called a cold or even dead state. They're alive, but they're like the walking dead, like zombies. Like, man, you ever met Christians like that? But they're Christians and have life, but they need reviving to bring them back to their first love and the healthy growth of the spiritual life. Listen to this, please. 
which conversion was meant to be the entrance. So many Christians go, dude, I did the deed. I've got hell insurance. I'm just going to pay my dues now every Sunday. Make sure it's still, you know, my, 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 my card's active, basically. Checking in. No. Listen to what he says. Healthy growth. Spiritual life by which conversion was the door of entrance. The door of entrance. Salvation is the first slice of the grace of God. It's an important slice. Can't eat any more bread unless you got that slice. But there's so much more to the Christian life than you going and getting yours. Man, that's miserable. I know so many people that have very little, and then have more than they should. I'll just say that. That don't live according to this mindset that I'm running a race. And one day, life, which I call probation for your new job description, called heaven, because there's work in heaven, man. It's your attitude, actions, and choices that determines your job description once you get there. Most Christians don't live that way. They have no idea that one day they'll stand before the Lord in a reward ceremony. They're just kind of focused on the judgment seat of Christ. That's done. Like, that's been settled. Let's go and live now for that which matters. Revival. Everything needs it. Your face, your home, your car, your body, your marriage, your parenting. Your business, everything needs constant refreshing and reviving. This is the way of life. This is true spiritually. Do you know who Annie Hawk is? Ever met her? No, you haven't, because she's not alive. She was alive in the 1870s. And if you have, you're like, wow, that's awesome. But Annie Hawk wrote this. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, O bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I'll be honest with you. I have grown up in church. I grew up in Christian schools. I've gone to many different training dynamics. I've served in many different churches. I've served in many different roles. I need Jesus and the grace of God every waking moment of my life. Because I know me, and I don't trust me. I don't trust the world, the devil, and the flesh around me. I need Jesus. Oftentimes, I think he takes people that are the worst of us and puts us in this situation because like, I need to keep that dude close to me. He's got to be in a job description that makes him read that Bible, you know? That's me. I know me. I know what I am apart from Christ. There's nothing good there. Nothing. Nothing. I need the Lord daily. I need a moment by moment. I need to be reminded of who I am and who I'm not. I need to be reminded of what matters and what does not. And I'm not going to get that from you. I get it from His. It's where you're going to get it. You're not going to get it from CNN or Fox. You're not going to get it from that social media feed. You're not going to get it from the Joneses, whoever those neighbors are, right? Like, let them be. You get it from this. And once you learn to use and live this, then this starts to make sense. But until you learn this, I don't know, man, you're like walking in the dark, grasping in the dark. You need a lamp to light your path, and it's the Word of God. This morning, I want to share three simple things with you. Well, we say, what are those? This morning, I'd like to submit to you three simple considerations for how we balance this daily need for revival and allow this daily need for revival become a daily reality in your life. Here's the first one. It comes from Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. If you're still there and not asleep yet, let me know by saying Jesus rebuilds and restores. Okay. Verse 1, part of verse 1 says this. 
All the people assembled with a unified purpose at the square just inside the water gate. That's enough right there to kind of get our first point. Here's the first point. We're better together, right, Jack Johnson? As one, right, Maximus? The flying V, Coach Bombay? Unity, unity. They all came together as one. Any pop song of whatever decade has always got tones and tenors and tinges of love and unity, love and unity, love and unity, love and unity. It's what we are designed for. Some of us want unity just in here. And I just need this to calm down. There's so many conversations, not schizophrenia, don't misunderstand. But did you know that you are the most influential person on yourself? You talk to yourself more than anyone else talks to you. And most of us speak in a way that is very unbiblical. We, we condemn ourselves. We compare ourselves. Stop it. Be unified in mind. How? The Word of God. We, we want unity in the tender relationships of our life, right? Spouse and kids. We want unity in the tough relationships. Say, what do you mean by that? Work. And just those people that you know, you're like, I don't want to get a burrito with that person. There's no chemistry there. But we want at least to kind of like get along, right? We desire this. But it does not come without our second consideration. If the first consideration is unity... Here's the second one. It starts in verse 1 and goes for a while. It's authority. Unity does not come without the proper authority. You say, well, who's the authority? Pay attention. Look at what it says. The remainder of verse 1 says, They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given for Israel to obey. So on October 8th, Ezra the priest brought the book of the law before the assembly, which included the men and women and all the children who were old enough to understand. And he faced the square just inside the water gate from early morning until noon and read aloud to everyone who could understand. And all the people listened to the book of the law. Early morning until noon is six hours. So if I only keep you for three, I'm doing you like a really good, you're getting half off here. You know what I mean? Like, but then look at what happens. Verse four, Ezra, the scribe, stood on a high wooden platform that had been made from the occasion. Look, he's plopping down God's word. He's on a stage so people can like, oh, there he is. Oh, that, I can hear him. I can see him. And to his right and to his left are 13 men. If you want to read their names, God bless you. Verse five. Ezra stood on the platform to full view of all the people. And when they saw him open the book, they curled up for a good nap. No, they stood up. When the word of God was read, listen to me. Let me have your attention. Let me have your eyes. They respected God's word. Even just the reading of it. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people chanted, Amen. And amen, they lifted their hands, they bowed down, they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 7, there's all the people. They instructed the people and the law while everyone remained in their places. And they read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read, helping people understand each passage. Here's what I love about this. If the first point is unity and the second is authority, here's the dynamic. Their unity was rooted under the right authority. This is another thing I love. What they do is what we do. Say, what do you mean? We gather to love God. We group to connect. And we go to live on mission. With what? With what we gathered and grouped about. Jesus. Verses 1 through 6, this is what they're doing. They're gathering to love and focus and put the attention on God. I need to share something with you as someone who's been in like this dynamic for the last 20 years trying to observe what the modern church has become. 
it almost seems like people think a worship gathering is for them. Like, it almost seems like there's shirts that are made, like, it's my church. Like, there's, like, this dynamic that, like, you, 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 <laughs> you think this exists for you. Th- this exists for God. This is his church. These are his people. This is his body, his bride, his temple. You think this is for you? No. This is for him. Preaching is first and foremost an act of worship from the one who preaches before it is ever meant to be a service to those who listen. If it is not, it will not be centered appropriately because the preacher is always concerned about his audience. His first audience. And if he's not, he's not worth listening to. The worship gathering, man, I'm here to serve. I'm here to give. I'm here to learn so I know how to live. I'm not just here to critique. Man, there wasn't enough bunny rabbit stories. It was two minutes too long. Listen to me. Please let me have your attention. Don't you understand? You're being deceived. You you, you believe that that which is meant for God is meant for you. No wonder you don't hang long. No wonder it doesn't have impact in the community like it's supposed to. It must be centered appropriately. The gathering is for him. Now, we benefit from it. I mean, if I didn't didn't get any benefit from it, I'd be like, okay, man, I'm not that, I can't keep doing this. But like, I benefit greatly from being at a gathering with God's people. But I don't come for me. I come for him and for them, for him and for them. And this is what they do. They they gather to learn. They gather to live. They recognize that God gave them his word not to just be observed, but obeyed. We even see a biblical precedent here for coastline kids. Look at verse 3. Like, you're like, hey, how come we have a kids ministry here? I'll be honest with you, man. I got a little boy named Leonidas Ulysses. That guy, he ain't going to pay attention in here. He's two years old. You put him in here, he's just going to start running, seeing how hard he can hit Liam, his brother. Like at the appropriate age, that's when they were gathered together to understand God's word. Thousands of them. Some people say, I don't want a gathering unless I know everyone in the room. Stop being so stinking selfish and stop being unbiblical. There were tens of thousands of people in this gathering. Should a gathering be small? I don't know. Every time I look at it in the Bible, they're talking about thousands. I don't know. See, that's not true. There's groups. Yeah, I'm talking about gatherings. Wait till we get to groups. See, here's the deal. There's a guy monologuing. His name is Ezra. On stage for six hours, reading God's word. And here's what happens. There's a response from the people. You know what makes the best preachers? Better congregations. That's what I heard one time. You know what makes the best preacher? People that like do it with them. Like I'm learning. I'm listening. I'm engaged. Because this isn't for us. This is for him. And the people were responding in agreement. They were singing. They're like bowing down, raising their hands, saying Amen. They're loving God, verses 1 through 6. Verses 7 through 8, you know what they're doing next? They're kind of grouping, connecting together, and there's leadership supporting the people, helping them understand God's word. Now, are they doing that in the tens of thousands? No. They're like in a group where they can actually be known. and go, Hey, I don't, I don't understand that. Oh, I can explain it. Or I don't get this. Oh, okay, we got a leader. He can help you. There's gatherings and groupings. People were there applying God's word. And then look at what happens in verse 9. Nehemiah, the governor at this time, Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites who were interpreting for the people said to them, listen, don't mourn or weep on such a day as this. For today is a sacred day before the Lord your God. For the people had all been weeping when they listened to the words of the law. They realized, whoa, we're like way off from what we should be doing. There's conviction. Man, if you can listen to God's word and go, I'm never convicted. Well, I mean, you need to wake up or talk to your wife. She'll help you. Like, she, you know, she'll show you. This is where you need to be convicted. You know what I mean? Like, um, 
And Nehemiah continued. Listen to what he says in verse 10. Go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share the gifts of the food with the people who have nothing prepared. That is the sacred day before the Lord. Don't be dejected and sad. For the joy of the Lord is a bummer. No, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the Levites, too, they quieted the people saying, listen, hush, don't weep. Today's a sacred day. I love this. There's unity in leadership. What the primary leader is supported by the secondary leader. Got to have that or else it doesn't work. So the people went away to eat and drink at a festive meal to share gifts of food and celebrate with great joy because they had heard God's words and understood them. Can I read this again? They went away to celebrate with great joy because the coffee was hot. Nope. They went away to celebrate with great joy because the facility was, oh, supremely clean. No. Because of the programs, because of the proximity to my home, because this reaches my demographic. No. Why? Because God's word was spoken and they got it. And they said, that's it for me. That's all I needed. God, through the authority of his word, brings both conviction and encouragement. The Bible reveals sin and reveals a Savior. And we constantly need to come under the authority of God's word. Listen, there's no human author you're going to agree with every time. But I love what this guy says in this moment. Listen to what old Johnny Mac says. He says, The church must create an atmosphere in which the word of God is honored and submitted to, in which human wisdom is never used to judge or qualify revelation. As far as the things of God are concerned, Christians must be totally under the teaching of Scripture and under the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Only then can we open to God's wisdom and truly become wise. Common commitment to the Word of God. Listen to this. Common commitment to the Word of God is the basic unifier. Why is America, why is the world, why are we, what is going on here? Rewind the clock 60 years ago. I'll tell you why. You lost the standard for that which is right and wrong. So now everyone will do what they think is right and wrong. Just give it enough time. We are now reaping Well, I don't want to be disrespectful in that sense, but I don't know all the elements. But a generation, let it go. The standard of truth was let go. And this generation reaps the consequences. When the word of God is not set up as the supreme authority, division is inevitable. Such happens even in evangelical, evangelical churches when pastors and other leaders begin substituting their own ideas for the truth of Scripture. And I, I very much agree with that. The substitution is seldom intentional, but it will always happen when the Bible is neglected. A Bible that is not studied carefully cannot be followed carefully. And where it is not followed, there will be division because there will be no common ground for beliefs and practices. When the truth of Scripture is not the sole authority, men's varied opinions become the authority. And who wins? The strongest wins. That's who wins. So who, 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 who has all authority and power in heaven and earth? Oh, Jesus. So should we be freaked out, frizzled, frustrated, and frazzled about the news? There's a plan. It's unfolding. Yes, it may get darker before it gets dawn. But the dawn is coming. Jesus is coming again. Read your Bible with a historical grammatical hermeneutic and you'll understand. Revelation hasn't already happened. It's coming. It's coming. So may we live in such a way that reflects truth. Don't live like an ostrich. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Like one end's up, one end's down. That's not the way you want to live. You want to be a head up, paying attention, focus on what's going on. 
2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is boring on Sundays. No. It's useful to teach us what's true, make us realize what's wrong, corrects us when we're wrong, and teaches us to do what's right. Can I ask you a question? Don't you feel like as a community or as a family or as a country, we could do with a little bit of clarity as to what is true and what is wrong, as to what to do to correct it and how to stay there? It's not going to happen through any other way than under the proper authority, God's Word. So what can we do? I would just say this. This is my opinion. This is a daily need for us to be daily in the Word. You are accountable for this, in my opinion. You have more access to the Scriptures than any other generation that has ever lived. This church, you may go to some other church that's here visiting today. We're stoked you're here. But this church is trying to come alongside you to help you get into God's Word daily. I would encourage you to revive yourself in your halitosis, if you know what that is, your bad breath, brush your teeth, but also in your spirit. Feed on God's Word. Because what you feed grows, what you starve dies. And your spirit is in constant need of good food. Constant need. I love what Warren Wearsby says. Because in this passage, you see them like mourning. And then you say, hey, don't mourn, celebrate. Well, I love what Warren says. He says, you know what? It's wrong to mourn when God has forgiven us. Man, some of us look to the past and we go, well, I did this and I did that. <laughs> Listen to me. Jesus forgave it. Deal with it. Let's move forward. Stop living in the past. It's over. Yes, time is necessary sometimes to heal. I'm not, I'm not disrespecting that. But I'm also saying we honor the past, but we don't live there. Dude, I barely remember Thursday. You know what I mean? Like, there's just so many kids and some, I'm like, I don't know. Someone asked me, how was your week? I was like, Pfft. I kind of remember yesterday, but um, I don't know. I'm right here right now. This is what I'm doing. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what's coming. I don't know where what, what was, but I, I'm right here. And I barely know what is, but like that's where I'm at. Most people don't live in the moment. That's why they don't ever live. It's the only place you can live. The past is gone. The future is a mystery. That's why you've been given the gift of the day called the present, right? Open that thing up every day. Live it. It's wrong to mourn when God has forgiven us as it is to rejoice when sin has conquered us. Some people like take joy in their sin. No, there needs to be conviction and encouragement at the appropriate time. Listen to what he says. I just thought this was interesting. The sinner has no reason for rejoicing and the child of God has no reason for mourning. Yes, as God's children, we carry burdens. And we know what it is to weep, but we also experience power that transforms sorrow into joy. Yes, grief is a part of life. You are meant to feel your feelings. I really believe that. God feels. Have you ever read the Bible? Do we live in our feelings? No. But if you stuff grief, if you kind of go through something that's traumatic and you go, I'm just not going to deal with that, that is going to eventually eke out through bad attitudes, bad health. Bad... Feel it. Deal with it. Go through it. Face it. Own it. And then keep moving. Because as a believer, sorrow is for a moment, but joy is forevermore. Forevermore. See, not only do they gather to love and group to connect, but listen, they go out and live on mission what the Word of God says. Our third and final point for this morning is going to come from verses 13 through 18. But let me kind of put it this way. I have a lot of little like sayings that someone told me, so I always remember them. But here's like the first one. Motion is lotion. I like that. It's either forwards or backwards. There's no neutral. And go until there's a no. I like that. If the first one was unity and the second one was authority, the third one, here's your third little key to revitalization of every single day, 
unity in mind, heart, body, and soul, and with those that matter. Under the authority of God's word. I don't care what you think about thus and so. I care what this says. I don't care what you think, Neil. I care what this says. Unity under the proper authority. And then this is the third and final. The right activity. Unity under authority without activity equals backwards. The dangerous one of most dangerous sins in America is listening to a sermon. Because you're hearing truth. And it almost deceives you. You're like, yeah, I agree with that, so I'm doing it. Are you? Are you? Let your spouse reflect that back to you. Let your family, let your coworkers go, you know, I don't know about that. That's not you. It's a challenge to be consistently around holy things because you can become desensitized to them. The Word of God is very holy, as is His Spirit, as is His people. Don't become too familiar with holy things. They should, in a way, keep us in a sense of awe. God loves us. I mean, have you met David? He loves that guy. That's amazing. He, he loves Creighton. This is awesome. Like, you ever hung out with those guys? Why would he love them? No, just kidding. Like, they're, like when you get to, you're like, man, this is awesome. God loves me. This is awesome. So maybe he has an activity, like Ephesians 2.10 says, good works for today that you're meant to enjoy. Well, let's see what happens. Verse 13 through verse 18, I'm going to read that. Before I do, let me know. You still there? Jesus rebuilds and restores? Okay, verse 13. On October 9th, the family leaders of all the people, man, there's a message in that right there, together with the priests and Levites, met with Ezra, the scribe, to go over the law in great detail. As they studied the law, they discovered that the Lord had commanded through Moses that all the Israelites should live in, in shelters or tents. They should go camping during the festival to be held that month. He had said that a proclamation should be made throughout their towns in Jerusalem, telling the people to go to the hills to get branches from olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees. And they were to use these branches to make shelters or pop-up tents in which they would live during the festival as prescribed by the law. Verse 16, so the people went out, they cut the branches. And they used them to build shelters on the roofs of their houses and their courtyards and the courts of God's temple and the squares just inside the water gate and the Ephraim gate. So everyone who had returned from captivity lived in these shelters during the festival, and they were all filled with great joy. The Israelites had not celebrated like this since the days of Joshua. It's like a revival's happening. They're like, man, do you, this is like what it was when Joshua was around. Ezra read from the book of the law on each of the seven days, and on the eighth day, oh, there's another sermon in this last line that I can't get into right now, but on the eighth day, they had held a solemn assembly, which was required by law. If you're a student of the scriptures, I'd encourage you to jump into that and find that out and why the pool of Siloam relates to that and why Jesus said, I am living water. When you do a study on that, it'll like kind of, if you have hair, you blow it back, but anyway. There's unity because they're under the right authority, and then there's the right activity. What's the activity? Life is meant to be lived. Well, what's the way to live it? According to God's word. Life is meant to be enjoyed. Like it says, like, eat the fat, drink the sweet. That's what the first part of this chapter says. The purpose of learning is to live. You ever seen that tweet or that meme, like, like a grandma, maybe with her Bible, and she's like, oh, I'm going to Bible study. And the, the like, grandkid goes, when's the test? You just keep studying. I don't ever see you taking a test. Like, like the point of learning is to see it transition into a life. That when you look at this, and you look at this, you go, oh, I see that. That's what it's meant. The people are getting a heart for God, and what should they do? They should just stop right there. Oh, they need to live it out. And they begin to realize that there's actually a feast this month in October that we're supposed to be celebrating as God's people. Now, here's the deal. This is another amazing Bible study that I wish I could give you, but I, I just don't got time. But in Leviticus chapter 3, there's actually seven feasts outlined, and they all point to Jesus. Let me just share them real briefly, because I just can't go over this. I feel like bad if I don't tell you this, but like the feast of Passover was in the spring near April. Did you know that that's when Jesus died on Passover? 
The Feast of Unleavened Bread is the day after Passover. That's the day Jesus was buried. The, the Feast of First Fruits is the first day of the week after Passover. That's the day Jesus rose again. The Feast of Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. That's the day the Holy, was Spirit, the Holy Spirit was given. Read Acts chapter 2, verse 41. The Feast of Trumpets, the fifth feast, is the first day of the seventh month. When is that? That's our October. So when did that happen? Read 1 Corinthians 15, 52. That's all I'll say about that. The Feast of Atonement, Yom Kippur, Day of Sorrow. When's that going to happen? Potentially when the Great Tribulation happens. The Feast of Tabernacles, the one that's being referenced here in Nehemiah chapter 8, corresponds to Zechariah 14, but it's the day where the Lord comes, establishes His presence and kingdom on earth, and there ain't nothing but joy. The feasts of this beautiful illustration of God's redemptive story. But don't miss the point of our time together this morning. God is regathering, rebuilding, and restoring a people who used to be far off from Him. This is where we close. I'm going to go ahead and invite the worship team up because we're going to close out here in just a moment. All of us are born of a woman, yes? That means we are created beings. You're not a creator. Even if you're an Instagram influencer, you're just aligning things that are already there and making something. But the only creator is God. The only creator is God. And you're meant to be filled with His Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you realize that all of you together, you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you. See, it's not really so much about buildings or temples or walls or cities. It's about lives. You're created to be inhabited, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The book of Nehemiah is a physical illustration of our spiritual dynamic. We have new life. We're not in Persia anymore. We're not in Babylon. We, we've been forgiven and set free. So we should gather to love and adore Jesus. We should group to connect, learn how to live out that word. And then we should go to live on mission. Listen to me. Let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. Gather, group, and go is the equation for balancing spiritual health. If you think, why is our family so like not what it should be? We, get, we gather because you don't group and go. Or if you say, we're always going, we're always doing, but we're not really a part of a local church. You don't gather. Or you say, man, we're all about the home church. We group together. Man, not going to work, man. You're supposed to gather, go, and group. It's a balance. It's a dance. It's, it's a ride. Spiritual problems are only solved by Jesus. He's the one that solves that spiritual problem. But spiritual health is a daily balance. And I'm gathering with God's people to make it all about Him. I'm grouping to connect and I'm going to live on mission. What they did is what we're doing. We all need daily revitalization, refreshing, and the restorative work of God in our lives. Every single human being has got to spiritually brush those teeth. I mean, just try it this week. If you don't believe me, try it in the physical. See what happens to you. You ain't going to have no friends. Nobody's going to talk to you. Fuzzy teeth situations. Spiritually, you can tell when someone's like, man, that guy's brushing his teeth spiritually. You know why? His breath smells good. Like, I just like being around that guy. Like, there's dreamers and drainers in life, right? You know what I mean? Like, you get that text, like, ooh, that's a drainer. I respond to that text. Whew. But then there's others, like, when you're around him, like, man, this guy, he like... I just want to do what God's called me to do when I'm around that person. It's because that person's filled with God's spirit. There's some health there. Now, how does this happen, right? Like, 
There needs to be unity between you and God, between you and others, between you and work. It needs to be balanced appropriately. Between you and play. Some people live for sport. Oh, man, don't do that. How, how do we do that? How is there unity in a marriage? How is there unity in a home? How is there unity in a church? How is there unity in a country? How is there unity in the world? Listen to me. You must come under the right authority for there to be unity. The authority is God's word. This is the standard. And then that is coupled with the right activity. Gather to love, group to connect, go to live on mission. Daily, get in God's word. You don't have to have a high IQ to hit YouTube or to read that first chapter, but do it daily. Do it daily. Group together in a connect group. It's the only way, coupled with gathering and going, that you're going to be able to balance health as you're meant to. You know what? Or just don't, man. Just live a hollow Christian experience. Keep eating a little bit of the world and a little bit of the church and just kind of halfway do this thing called life. And when you get to heaven, get half of the rewards you're supposed to. I mean, that's what you can do if you want. But do one or the other. Don't hang in the middle and deceive yourself. Like, like go for it or don't. Because I think Jesus says, I'm not going to cast my pearls before swine. There's other people out there that, that want to. I'm going for them. Does that mean he doesn't love you? No, he loves you so much. He wants to like partner with you through his spirit to see life and joy and peace and goodness. But you've got to open your heart to him. And not just in a moment when like the very cool scents are playing, right? But like on a Tuesday when traffic on 98 is like, when is this bridge going to happen? You know, like... It's daily, man. Unity, authority, activity. We're better together. As one, the flying V. Unity. How do we get there? Everyone wants that. Unity without authority equals anarchy. You don't see that in what's going on in the world that you live in? But under the right authority, we can be unified. And as we move forward in activity, going about our Father's business, there's joy, there's peace, there's hope, there's life. And you know what? You stop sin sniffing. You stop looking around at everybody else and going, can I see that? I see that. No, you know what you start doing? Lord, I need you every day, every hour. I'm yours. I'm not judge and jury for anyone. I'll leave that job to you, Lord trust you.